Advances is a joint venture collaboration between the Opportunity Through Entrepreneurship Foundation and AZ Bio, which I have the privilege to lead um, with our board of directors. And that combination is going to do three things. It is going to fo focus on the workforce. It is going to support the entrepreneurial skills, which is why we're partnering with NACD, to bring in some of those skill sets to help our companies grow to the point where they are ready to move to the next level. And there needs to be funding. And this is critically important because so often people come up to me and they say, hey, you know, I, I want to meet the VCs. Can you give me a list of the VCs that you know? And I say, send me your one sheet. Let me see where you are. What milestones have you passed? Where are you going? And, and I'll say, you're not ready to talk to the VCs. You haven't got the team in place. You have not gotten the test results in place. You haven't got a proof of concept. You haven't done your market analysis. And then there's this deer in the headlights look of, well, but where do I get the money to do that? Sometimes students get upset with me when they come up to me and they say, I have this great idea for a business. And there, don't get me wrong, there are students that have made, created amazing businesses. But if you can't pay your rent, if you can't feed your family, if you can't pay for your gas when it's $5 a gallon, you're not going to get your company to the finish line. You're just not. And so building those partnerships, having resources that can support the companies, getting them to the stage where they have hit those milestones, where they have brought in people that have been there and done that multiple times, is critically important. And that's what AZ Advances is about, is to help them get to that stage. Workforce. Okay. If we're going to double the size of the life science industry here in Arizona by 2033, uh, every time I say that I get the shivers, um, if we're going to achieve that goal together, right, everybody's wearing the Arizona pins, you've all taken the pledge, we're going to get there. If we're going to do that, we are going to have to double, actually triple the size of our workforce. Which means we've got a lot of teaching to do, a lot of training to do, a lot of mentoring to do. That's why, you know, this week we are raising money for student internships. Every time we raise another five grand, I get to give an internship to another kid. That's a cool thing. And so as we go through this process, that's important. But we also have to have jobs so that we're not training the next generation and shipping them off to another state which means that we have to grow those jobs here with our entrepreneurs in the room, with our large company partners, with our healthcare partners. Okay, do you know that the number one job on the AZ Bio job list every single week is? Phlebotomists. Tom Legg is from Snore Request. He's sitting in the audience going, yep, phlebotomists. I have postings for 50 to 60 phlebotomists per week because we are a diagnostics powerhouse in Arizona and that means we draw a lot of blood. So as we continue to move forward, we have to be thinking about how we develop that workforce. We have to support the entrepreneurs and we have to have the funding, the small funding, the 25 grand, the 50 grand, the 100 grand, and in some cases millions or multiple millions to get a company to that first step so that they can show that they have the direction and the proof to go forward. That's what we're working on. Now, somebody said, well, how long have you been working on this? Well, this particular project in several iterations, because they all, you know, you pivot and you adjust. 
started in 2014 when I brought my VC friends in and they said, Joan, you got a great stuff here, but I'm just going to take it out because you have no ecosystem. And so now for almost a decade, we've been working on addressing those issues, checking them off one at a time. There is no major institutional investor in Arizona for the life sciences. We will have to build that. You heard the governor and Senator Gowan last night talk about the Health Innovation Trust Fund. That is the first step on building an Arizona institutional. In addition to that, we also you know, have to walk the talk. We have to make investments in early stage companies that we see as having potential, not only because they need the money, which there's no question, they always need the money, but they need the credential of, as Richard said, if you can't raise money at home, you ain't gonna raise money anywhere else, right? And so I am pleased to announce, drum roll, <laughs> we have just made our first three AZ Advances portfolio investments. And now I would like to invite the leaders of those companies to come join me on stage and talk a little bit about what they're up to. So Elsa Bruzo from Anuncia, Stan Mealy from Aqualung, and Jordan Lancaster from Avery. And my husband was proofing my slides for me last night because I was kind of tired. And he said, do you realize that all these companies are begin with an A? Are you going in alphabetical order? <laughs> and I'm like, no, it just worked out that way. So let's sit down and let's learn a little bit about them. Congratulations, guys. Make sure your mics are on. They've been turned off. All right, well, now I get to do the easy part and just get you started um, because I know you don't ever like to talk about your own companies. Um, but I get to know, I mean, I've gotten to know all of you, some of you from inception, from student days. Absolutely. Um, but, but beyond that, um, I've gotten the opportunity to see your companies progress over time and start to hit those milestones that investors are looking for, right? So not only did you get to be the first portfolio companies, but now you will be those examples that will have to help the next one and the next one and the next one. Because as Elsa will tell you, once you get into my web, I, I just keep putting you to work. It's a good web. <laughs> <laughs> so, so to kick things off, Elsa, you know, I would like, and, and it's, we're gonna go down the line, guys, so you get to think, what is Anuncia's mission? I mean, what, what are you trying to accomplish? Thank you for that, Joan. So I, I don't know if you guys know uh, much about hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus is a condition and neurological conditions like it that affect about 50 million people worldwide. And in essence, it's extra cerebral spinal fluid uh, builds up in your brain. It's there for a reason, but if it builds up uh, and you can't get rid of it, it causes your tissues to uh, you know, go under pressure. This intracranial pressure can create uh, severe symptoms, cognitive impairment, and even death if it's not treated. It's typically shunted, but shunts fail about a rate of 50% in two years, 80% in five years. And um, Anuncia's mission is to first resolve that problem, and then take care of the next largest problems that affect these patients uh, worldwide. And so we've done that with a product that uh, is a Reflow. And by the way, you can get hydrocephalus. A lot of people think it's just a pediatric disease. Uh, it affects from infants to the elderly. You can get this at any age for a variety of reasons, right? You can be born with it, or you can get it from a TBI, or a stroke, or an infection, right? Or even a brain tumor. 
So, um, in fact, um, I'm going to make a plug for the AZ uh, um, bio uh, patient, uh, voice of the patient, um, our vice president of sales and marketing, uh, Mark Geiger, who's at the back of the room, um, is actually going to be speaking because he is a hydrocephalus patient. He was shunted at around 14 from a meningitis infection that scarred his ventricles. And he has had five revision surgeries. And you'll hear his journey there along with other patient journeys. Uh, but those, that is the problem that we're here to resolve with reflow. Uh, but, and I'll talk a little bit about reflow, but we have thought out very deliberately, very thoughtfully about how we complement reflow. Because we learn and, and evolve this mission based on our patient needs and our customer needs. We hear from them, we get this feedback, and we say, wow, reflow is going to resolve occlusions in shunts. But it can also do that when the patient comes into the ER uh, for in getting neurocritical care and is placed on an external ventricular drain waiting for their stroke to resolve, their ICP to go down so they can be shunted, their protein counts to go down. We can help those patients too. Oh, and by the way, reflow use and now cleared for this has evolved so that we can now have these patients empower them to take care of themselves at home and expand this access to care. And so the, the pipeline of products that we have are centered on the, our core expertise, the, this platform, and taking care of these patients and these customers. And so we just launched Reflow June 30th. And I'm very happy to say that uh, in, the, in two months, we already have over 18 cases at five US hospitals. We have about... Uh, another 14 hospitals pending uh, VAC approval and about 67 units uh, uh, pending or, or, um, quoted and pending order. Um, and we've taken this time to uh, train about 10 to 12 dealers um, with almost 80 sales reps in about 40, covering 49 states. So we're really ready to get this going. And it's been because of, you know, AZ advances and uh, angel groups like ATI and, um, you know, just local investors as well, uh, support from ASU. So we were part of the ASU Mail Accelerator. This has been an incredible ride, and reflow is just a start. Uh, but, you know, beyond this mission to solve these problems for our patients, we want to hire. We want to expand the ecosystem here with Joan and AZ Bio and all of you know my colleagues. So um, we're ecstatic to be one of the first uh, health uh, accelerating health innovation uh, funded companies. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Elsa, and and thank you for your team's help throughout the week. And uh, Sophia is here. I know she's been putting it putting in long hours. And uh, it's very, very important that the ecosystem all come together. So thank you for your support. Stan. Yes, Joe. <laughs> and, and by the way, we have a really good band Friday night. So maybe. Oh, OK. Maybe right. not that not that Aqualung. I'm, I'm often asked, are we big Jethro Tull fans? And so um, I would say that our founder is a Jethro Tull fan, but uh, there's a story behind that, but maybe if we have some time, or maybe a little bit later, I'll talk to that. But first of all, I want to thank you, Joan and Russ and AZ Advances, and uh, kudos to you both as well for this sort of inaugural um, note. Of, I guess just uh, it's it's very I'm very humbled. But I will say that as it relates to Aqualung, I joined uh, I joined Dr. Garcia, gosh, about three and a half years ago, and he's a physician scientist from. He was at the University of Arizona, and over 600 publications, he's a world-renowned pulmonologist, critical care physician. And he made a comment that, that stuck with me, and he said, before I hang up my cleats, I want to find something that can treat patients with acute lung injury. And I met him at a Starbucks, and we started this sort of interesting marriage, and here we are several years later. But he had identified a protein that's central to 
unchecked or runaway inflammation, as well as fibrosis. And this is a, it's an upstream protein. And in fact, when patients or animals are put on mechanical ventilation, or if you have pulmonary arterial hypertension, it's the number one protein expressed. And so here we are, it's like, why is it in 2023, they hadn't really recognized this protein up until this point in time. So to make a long story short, um, our mission is to identify novel therapeutics that can treat any diseases that are really driven by unchecked inflammation as well as fibrosis. And inflammation writ large is just about involved in everything, every disease pathology to some extent. And if we fast forward to where we are today, we know that uh, we're moving into, we've already done a phase one human clinical trial and healthy volunteers and the monoclonal antibodies working superbly. And as of today, we're actually starting to screen patients in a phase 2A study as well in moderate to severe acute respiratory distress syndrome. So what's been exciting for me as part of this mission is I've sort of bought into Dr. Garcia's overall gestalt. It's like we are, we are on a mission. And I'll, I'll talk maybe a little bit more about the investor side of things. But I think what's really fascinating to me is we're not here to be the 10th the drug for psoriatic arthritis or for Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. And, those are certainly unmet needs to some extent, but we're here to find diseases that are driven by inflammation and fibrosis that are significant unmet medical needs like ARDS that has no FDA approved therapy. Yet there's a 40% mortality rate, 2 million patients globally, 500,000 alone in the US, and the number one cause of mortality associated with severe COVID-19. And we still don't have an approved FDA product as of today. And we feel like we've cracked the code. And I'll talk about that later. But it's very, very exciting and humbling to be part of the tip of the spear here. And we're, we're on a mission. And we're not going to give up on this mission because it goes beyond ARDS. This is about really trying to focus on those rare or those, those unmet medical needs that are driven by inflammation. And we know this protein is very cent a central figure to that. So, um, you know, when I met Dr. Garcia, and then I'll close, he had an idea, and he had some interesting preclinical evidence. And it's been a fun journey over the last three and a half years to get from an idea and an inception, and thank goodness, some NIH grants, mm -hmm. but to where we are today, where we have manufactured products, We've already done all our IND, we're in human clinical trials, and that's super exciting. And, and you know, I'm very thankful to be part of the, the AZ Bio ecosystem in and of itself, but, and I'm gonna be talking to one of the recruiters here, believe me, I wanna hire a lot more people. I need a lot more people. And so it's that interesting interplay between investment capital and the like, but we absolutely are poised for growth and uh and i couldn't think of a better place to try and be involved and for those that spoke earlier about boston i spent many years of my career up at in boston at, with millennium but i'm so thankful to be here and i'm hopeful that we can become the next boston in cambridge mass because i love it here it's so much nicer so thank you thank you jordan First, uh, thank you. It's a, it's a wonderful opportunity to be here. Thank you for everything that you do in AZ Advances. I'm humbled for the opportunity to, to be one of the portfolio companies and an opportunity to speak here today and to uh, be with you two today. Um, you know, I have an interesting journey through uh, from a student perspective. Our relationship goes back a number of years here, but really, you know, being a student back in the lab, just curious about science and the opportunities that can, that can uh, come from that and being in a pretty very rich ecosystem of, uh, of having a mentor and having science and, and a BD sort of uh, environment around us. Um, and we, we developed a novel technology which we spun out into a company that we, we, is Avery Therapeutics. Um, and today that company is much different from where we actually started our journey and the evolution of that is an incredible tale and the team we've built around that and the community here in Arizona that's flourished alongside us. Um, what I can say today, similar to Stan's story, is that we're developing biologic therapeutics to redirect the immune system to treat diseases of aging, inflammation, and fibrosis. 
you think about it, the body is an, an amazing system. We have all these different organ systems, but what interconnects all of those systems is the immune system. And so if we can develop novel therapeutic keys within that immune system, it allows us to drive into a number of different or develop a number of therapeutic targets and driving into a number of different indications. So with under that umbrella, we're stepping into heart failure, which is the leading cause of death in the world. There's about 64 million patients diagnosed globally with heart failure. Six million plus of those are here in the United States. Um, so we've taken this biologic drug product that we've developed, meaning we're taking cells, it's a biopharmaceutical, we engineer that into a very sophisticated delivery substrate. Um, and we've been, been through extensive preclinical testing, and we're sitting on data sets that are really showing the curative nature of this approach. And keep in mind today, there are no curative therapeutics for heart failure. So we are literally fixing broken hearts um, with our, our lead indication here. And it's been a really exciting opportunity for us to advance uh, building out on top of that science, a rich scientific advisory board, our, our governing board, um, and also just interfacing and, and giving students new, you know, and young individuals an opportunity to learn and grow. And we've started pulling students from uh, through masters programs that that are interfacing with industry, bringing them in, uh, but also forward looking of how are we going to be adding to that, uh, to that workforce in the future, how can we work with our community college or technical schools for all the manufacturing quality systems that we need to be operating within um, is something that we're keen on, on exploring and, and setting those bounds within, de developing that within Arizona. And, you know, and that's such a great point. And Jordan, um, you know, you're, I think, the closest, and I'm gonna then flip this to um, Stan because he and Skip are, are very integrated with the universities too, but your relationship with the U University of Arizona and and the uh, senior leaders on your team that are still at the University of Arizona, can you share a little bit about how that university relationship has helped you move forward? Yeah, um, and, it, and it's a relationship that's continuing to evolve, and so I think we're probably I'll share it in kind of a stepwise process of what we felt early on and, and, and where we've ended up today. You know, when we were really on that academic side of things, we had this this really novel data and this very exciting these outputs, uh, and we had these patents, and we were kind of like, okay. Uh, and so we went to the university, and they they had at that point rebooted Tech Launch Arizona. Uh, it was still Dave Allen at the time. It transitioned to Doug Hockstead, and they really gave us a, that first framework by which we could be operating and thinking beyond the laboratory and thinking about the patient and commercialization. And that allowed us the ability to sort of say, okay, well, let's build a roadmap. And I remember those meetings fondly because we'd have them and, and we'd, you know, we'd be burning through our hour and we got one more question, one more question. And, and you're going to these individuals in this network that you could, we could dip into and get that knowledge. Um, we did go through an interesting, once we licensed our technology formally and stepped out, we went through this traditional SBIR route, uh, which was great. We released space originally at the university, but we, uh, which was very economic, but we had to create our own environment. We really needed our own our name and brand and, and whatnot. So we set up a facility outside of the university, um, but the university continues to play a rich role in our thinking in regards of just so many different of, of aspects of particularly going back to students and helping channel that moving forward. Um, so the university continues to be a strong connector for us. And also, um, you know, what we found is that while we pulled Avery out, those rich scientific roots that are still at the university are a critical pipeline of development for us of knowledge and maintaining those relationships within the university are important. Thank goodness the University of Arizona does, does an excellent job of helping us manage those risks moving forward. So you know, we wouldn't be where we are today without that university connectivity, um, and it's, it continues to be a good relationship for us. That's great. And so Stan, you, know, you, you mentioned um, Skip, right? So those of you, like if you're looking for the papers, it's Joe, NG, yeah. Garcia, blah, blah, blah. And, and he just says, call me Skip, <laughs> right? Um, Skip you know, is still practicing um, as a physician. He's a leading physician scientist at the University of Arizona. He's led major hospital in, you know, in Chicago. You know, um, how has your relationship with the university, how has that helped you with the things that you're working on? Well, as I mentioned earlier, we've been very fortunate in that uh, from a non-dilutive capital perspective, we've garnered almost 30 million in NIH grants, which has really helped us get to the point where we are today, quite frankly. And a lot of that is the 
the connectivity between the Garcia lab at University of Arizona, and he's a prolific grant writer. Mm -hmm. He's actually taught me a lot about that. Um, and the, the fact that I don't, I didn't, I still don't at this point in time have my own separate lab per se. So all of this is just a coordinated approach. All of our Tech Launch Arizona, all of our IP method of use patents, everything flows through the University of Arizona. But the nice part of this is that all of the, it, all 12 publications specifically relating to our monoclonal antibody in a, multiple disease states, all of the, that was all preclinical work that's been done at the University of Arizona in mm -hmm. those labs there. So we, we've just, you know, we'll continue to carry this forward. We certainly, at a certain point, you have to go outside, and we're there now with, with a CRO doing human clinical trials, but we continue to look at multiple indications, and that's what the NIH continues to fund. They want, this goes well beyond just acute lung injury, and so it's into cancer, it's into pulmonary hypertension, all different types of fibrosis. So we're at a point now where we just have to keep cranking out a lot of those very well validated preclinical models, and that's all done in coordination with the lab and through the university. Cool. So, Elsa, you didn't start a company in Arizona. You know. <laughs> why? Why are you here? So, so, thank you for that question. But I, I want to touch base on because you you called on them because of their involvement. Yeah coming out of the university. And I wanna talk about a company that didn't come from a university that's really now involved with the university. Okay. So, um, so yes, yeah, so we were actually founded uh, within another company in Lowell, Massachusetts. So the whole Boston oh, connection yeah. goes, you know, all over. And, um, and it, we spun out of that um, company in about 2018. Uh, launched the first generation product of this reflow, got it through some post-market clinical validation, uh, doing great, interest from strategics, COVID hits. Um, we find out that we have to do some tweaks to the device, not for safety or anything like that, just make it uh, more adoptable, uh, broader patient population. And you know, we start thinking, and by the, by the way, I was here. I'm a trailing spouse. My husband works for Phoenix Children's a Hospital. And, uh, and I go, wait, why do I have to keep the company in Lowell? <laughs> you know, this is an amazing place. And I tell you, we were just, the reception here, when I started looking out, I reached out to, um, you know, the Phoenix Economic Development Council. And I always pass by Skysong and I go, oh, that's a really cool place. I wish my company was there one day. And, you know, we, we talked to, you know, at the time, Eric Bopp was there, now he's with Discovery. Uh, Oasis, and we talked to the folks at Skysong, and um, just AZ Bio, everything. So we settled on, on uh, at this uh, Skysong. We're in Building Four, which is the one right by the street, and uh, we've hired from ASU. So we get a lot of ASU support. We've hired, including our VP of R and D, who's sitting at the back there. Uh, about five ASU engineers in this time, right? Out of the 15 people that we have uh, in the company. We are now collaborating um, on some new IP and you know, licenses through a Skystone Innovation, which runs the, um, the IP for the uh, Arizona State University. And so this is kind of a story of, you know, we were in this big pond kind of being ignored and although this is technically a bigger city, right, it's, it's uh, just so refreshing that you get to meet so many more people and you have m much more support than you would there. Um, and of course, we would love to tap into some grants and now with the support of the university and some of the local institutions, uh, we have collaborations uh, that we're starting with the uh, Barrow uh, Neurological Institute and Banner and others. So we're, we're really excited to be here Really, um, I love the desert landscape. I almost like the heat. Um, so, <laughs> so we're really happy here. So as you've been based here and you've hired our students and you've worked in our industry and um, guys, as a networker, she puts you to shame. I mean, she's out all the time. 
Um, That's because he has $30 million of grant. <laughs> and I'm always raising. <laughs> <laughs> Little do you know. <laughs> I, I'm still mar marveling over the fact that Michael Chambers has five daughters. <laughs> it's a good thing he sold his company for all that money because he's going to need it. Yeah. But um, as you look out you know, across the ecosystem, what are some of the things that you have found that are the most helpful? And then get ready because I'm also going to ask you for the back side of that question. So Elsa, why don't you kick us off and then we'll kind of pass it along. What's been the most helpful? Meeting Joan. <laughs> yes. No, truly. Um, you know, there's so many uh, folks and institutions here that have been helpful. Uh, we were so fortunate to receive a Flynn Biopreneur grant. We were part of the ASU Mayo uh, MedTech Accelerator earlier this year. Uh, we were, uh, you know, a, a, you know a part of the Governor Celebration of Innovation uh, in uh, 2021. Uh, you know, there's just been such amazing support, but truly, Joan, it's it's easy by on meeting you, to be honest. I mean, I think that you want to talk about connector. You know, and someone who's really behind, you know, this ecosystem and these companies and, you know, not biased and objective, but just always uh, pushing in a good way, it, it's you. And we couldn't thank you enough for everything that you've done. And I hadn't planned to do that, by the way. <laughs> All right, so Stan, what's been helpful? And, and don't make this a Joan Fest, please. Don't make this a Joan Fest. Well, I have to echo Elsa's <laughs> comments, but I, I just, uh, I think it's twofold. So AZ Bio, you've been um, sort of a linchpin to, to make some of those important introductions over time. And, uh, and I do think it's a combination of that coupled with the relationship with the University of Arizona as well and Skip's lab and, you know, the, the, all, they all work in harmony, right? It's not just done in isolation. And, and so I think when those are put together and it's because it's not just one event, right? It's always you're always working behind the scenes in defense of us and I call you and complain if I, is this, that, that's happened probably more than once um, because and that sort of goes to the flip side of if I have a frustration I think it's I think there's great uh, there's great institutional investors in this state but I think it's definitely earmarked a little bit more towards device and AI SaaS and some of those things but I think on the on the therapeutic side, we're, we're not quite there yet, but we're getting there because of the work you're doing. And I think so we're at the beginning of a groundswell and um, I look forward to the next 10 years and what is before us because I think there's, there's some great, very, very good science coming out of this state. And I, I, you know, from a biotech and on the therapeutic side, I, I would put our stuff and some of the things that are going on and some of the other colleagues here Reglagene and what these people are doing. There's some great science coming out of here. And I'd put it up against all of those people that I know up in Boston and Cambridge. But I think um, we're just on the cusp of some really good things to come. Jordan, what's been the most helpful? Most helpful. Um, so, you know, if I go back to day one, there's two things there's Tech Launch Arizona and there's AC Bio. So I, I wanted to hear one more time, but I remember the first opportunity we had to actually go to Bio was through an AZ, or through Bio International, was through an AZ Bio deal that was set up. And there was a whole Arizona booth that Jen and I had mm -hmm. an opportunity to participate in. And that was our first step into this international world of being taking this company and, and having that outward look. And you gave us that opportunity. Mm -hmm. So it was a really foundational moment for us to understand that, what was going on in the world, and then how to access that and, and tap into it for the resources we needed. Um, so that was you know, a couple of things um, to, and I think we covered a lot of great bases here, but just outside of it, interestingly, um, Arizona in general has interesting connectivity with so many people. Um, I'm from Tucson, so I'll, I'll throw that out there, but the Tucson connections are also quite impressive. The banking titans, the med tech titans, the, um, th there's so many connectivities that, that we make on, when I'm traveling around the country is that, Oh, I'm from Tucson. They're like, oh, uh, I was meeting with a, a, a very large uh, 
biotech individual uh, out of Europe, and he goes, my sister lives in Tucson. And it's, so it's this interesting place that always has this thread that you can pull on, I believe. And we've had very good success of navigating that just because of actually kind of where we're mm -hmm. from. And so that, you know, it, there's an interesting just thread that we've been able to pull on. And some of those people, like the you know, one of our, our very prominent board members is because he comes to Tucson, he's Boston based, uh, but loves Tucson and, and set up shop here. And he, so we have access to him. So it's an interesting just connectivity that people have, which is just Arizona in general. Okay, so what's the ugly, guys? Come on, there's gotta be some things that Funding. we have to work on. Okay, I heard one. No, I think as I mentioned, uh, my hope is that we eventually get to the point where we have the likes of an Orbimed, an Arch, an NEA, and from a therapeutics perspective, you know, one of the, the big guys can be housed out of Arizona. And that's not going to happen overnight, right? Because a lot of that is the system of people that have been in the industry like me for 33 years. And, you know, I have a couple, you have a couple good strategic exits and then you start building, right? That you start building your, those other cadre members come in, some that have had a very good strategic exit, and then it starts to just sort of build upon itself. And I think that's what we eventually should get to, but I know that's your vision as well. So for me, you know, I think we're all acutely aware of the environment today. I think if I'm forward looking for me, it's um, it's really uh, technical staff. Uh, mm -hmm. If I if I'm going to be building an organization that's doing something inherently different and we're ba manufacturing complex things like cells, mm -hmm. uh, I'm starting to, to look at that, you know, sort of on that three year plus horizon saying, how do we find these people? How do we work with our, uh, you know, community colleges or other academic centers to be training these individuals to bring them in? Um, the other component of it is also just, you know, uh, you know recruiting people, uh, you know, we want to maintain that, that Arizona front, recruiting people in here, we've had actually success with that, and then building out that ecosystem to train those students and, and forward looking um, is, is a thing that I'm keen to solve and, and you know, mentoring those students to do the, the things that we need in the future. Elsa? So I had mentioned funding, um, and I would add to that maybe manufacturing. Um, as well. So I, I do think that the funding scene here has improved quite a bit and there's a lot of angel groups. So, but I still feel, and, and some micro VCs, but I still feel like there is more interest in um, AI, med tech, software, and, and pure tech than in um, biotech or medical device. I, I think you know, it's an educational process, whereas in other areas like Boston, Minneapolis, San Francisco, and other hubs, uh, it's a l little easier for, you know, they understand this industry and these investors, you know, have a, a bit more confidence in what you're doing because they are longer term mm -hmm. projects, right? And so um, I, I do think that we need to Im improve there, but I do think that it has been improving. And certainly that doesn't stop us from looking for funding elsewhere, but as you know, you said earlier, mm -hmm. uh, it's important to have funding from your local investors in your state. It shows credibility, it shows that, you know, and and frankly, you know, it's 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 very important for seed, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, I would say that. And then manufacturing, and we were very fortunate that you know we were able to actually bring uh, through our VP of manufacturing a manufacturing company uh, to Tempe Remedy uh, mm -hmm. uh, Medical Manufacturing. We also have the ability to go down to Tucson and work with like Spectrum uh, Plastics, which is you know a global. Uh, firm um, and uh, you know just with a variety of uh, different uh, manufacturing centers, but I think that there's needs you know more of that I think a lot of companies are struggling and especially in this uh, day and age with supply chain issues and and uh, whatnot. Um, I think that we need to build that infrastructure of both funding and manufacturing to keep attracting and growing these companies that we have in our ecosystem. Thank you. So. As we look at um, you know the the new things that are coming down the pipeline, and you know we've we haven't really focused on COVID today because no nobody wants to talk about COVID. Everybody's over it. Um, although I will tell you that the by the number of cancellations that I've gotten this week from people saying I'm so sorry I can't make it. I just tested positive for COVID. We ain't over it. Um, 
but we're learning to live with it. And so a lot of the things that, that came out of COVID, whether it was recognition that mRNA technology is actually a usable technology, which there were some people that didn't understand it, um, the recognition, most people didn't know what ARDS was unless they were a pulmonologist pre-COVID. Um, the concept that, I mean, you would think we've been cleaning pipes for years. Why did it take so long to figure out that you could flush a shunt? Right? There, there are so many things that come out of these discussions, and I think we heard earlier today also, um, you know, the, the conversation with, with Stephen Johnson, where he said, well, it was just logical. Why didn't anybody look at this before? It was just logical. If this stuff is so logical, guys and girls, okay, um, why is it so hard to just do it? Why isn't it just we do it because it's logical? What are the pathways you have to get through to get there? Elsa, kick us off. Wow. All right. Thank you for that question. <laughs> so um, it isn't for the faint of heart. And it, it, it's painful. It's a painful process. Uh, you know, every day, you know, wh while you're funding and you're building the company, you're, you're, you're trying to figure ways. So how can I resource more efficiently? How can I do this without, you know, with less spend and, and all these things? So it's, it's a pretty difficult process. And I think that the reason that a lot of these things aren't done is because it takes these small companies, these entrepreneurs, these founders, who are willing to take the risk because they're passionate about you know that solution that they're bringing out to do it the big guys don't want to do it uh they don't want to do it until it's a certain you know way down the de-risk uh you know road and and so the a lot of these things if it isn't for these companies that are willing to take this this risk and go through this very painful you know process uh, to get there, um, it, it wouldn't happen. And so you have probably, you know, a lot of ideas that should have come to market a long time ago, certainly in our case, right? I mean, this thing is working, it's simple, it's it's fantastic. And for 70 years, you know, shunts have been failing without this. So um, we, I, I think that this ecosystem and what startup companies, biotech, medtech, you know, medical device do is very important because we provide that engine that resolves, you know, the risk, you know, to, to get these products out. I think that's. So Jordan, we've had Band-Aids for years. And I remember Jen trying to explain to me at one time, well, it's kind of like a Band-Aid, but it's not. Okay, what's the Band-Aid? What's the Band-Aid? <laughs> so, uh, Joan's referring to uh, a, 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 what our product actually looks like, which is, so we engineer a uh, bioabsorbable, we use a bioabsorbable mesh, we load that with a biologic cell product, and that uh, is essentially our delivery platform of our product going into the heart. Uh, what we've really learned is that um, our story, and this took time to figure out, is so much larger than what we actually started on. And that Band-Aid that we've been trying to tell people about is actually really just a delivery platform for specific, specific indication, right? And it took a lot of backroom biology and uh, proteomics and genomics going back to the university side of things to really understand what the heck this thing was doing because we could create this beautiful beating heart patch in a dish and you could sit there and I mean, we had people cry when they saw this 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 patch just beating, and and um, you know, but it really wasn't the thing that made everything work. Um, so it was just this sort of interesting evolution of of a company and its identity and that first stepping stone, but then sort of taking a stepward back look and, and reflecting on what actually we have there. Um, and so for us, it took you know, you're just finding those stepping stones and going back to the root of the science to understand mechanistically from a drug target perspective how this thing is working, realizing that what we had created is there's a lot of biology in there that can be leveraged in a lot of different directions. And here is just a unique application of how we can apply it in this one indication uh, 
but it can be formulated in so many different ways or applied in so many different ways. And I think you know, that's one of the things we're seeing is, is the new application. So Stan, you know, I know that you know, Skip, and he said the same thing to me, before I hang up my boots, right? Um, and, and ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome was, was that, you know, that was his windmill that he was going after. Um, but when we look at acute inflammation, you're talking about a spectrum of indications. One of the things that I'm watching right now, obviously because I spend time in Washington, D.C., is the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, which um, we, our industry exists to help patients. Okay. There is no reason th that in this country, in this world, in this day and age, that our patients should not be able to access the medicines that they need to survive and thrive. There is no reason. So, so with that statement, I also want to, you know, make sure that we understand that when you pass large pieces of omnibus legislation that do really good things, okay, getting insulin down to $35 a vial was a very good thing. Lowering the patient copay for Medicare patients which there shouldn't be one in the, in the first place. They didn't choose to get old and they didn't choose to get sick. So why do they have a copay? But they do. And it's part of the structure and that's what we live with. So those things in the Inflation Reduction Act were really good things. The pay force in the Inflation Reduction Act, so the way that we got those really good things is we did what's called a pay for. And so for every dollar that they spent to help the patients, they had to find a dollar somewhere else to take out of the budget to pay for it. And the way they did that was they established some artificial pricing negotiation rules that are now starting to impact the industry. Now, why am I bringing it into this discussion? Well, this is an investor discussion. And now this is an investor problem. So, Jordan, you have a biologic. Stan, you have a biologic. And Elsa, you've got a medical device, but don't think you're gonna be on the, off the hook for long. So, what is happening is the large companies who have the highest spend in certain products with Medicare are going to be basically go into negotiation. They've already picked the first 10 drugs. They have started negotiation. At the end of the negotiation period, it is a take it or leave it. You either take the negotiated price that the government gives you or you pay an excise tax, that's off your top line, not your profits, of 95% of everything that you sell to Medicare. Or you just don't sell in the United States at all. So those are your choices. And your drug, even if you have an orphan indication, you're only exempted on one orphan indication. So if you want to go and expand to the next inflammatory disease and the next inflammatory disease and the next inflammatory disease, now you're eligible for price controls too. What the impact that's having in the marketplace right now with investors and Steve Potts, you know, and I work together, he did some amazing survey work um, as this has been evolving and as a matter of fact, um, those of you go to the AZ Bio website under news today, you will see there is a story about Dr. Potts on the Vital Health podcast, which is an international podcast, talking about this issue. And he actually testified in Congress last week on this issue. The results are this. The market for funding small molecules, 
you guys are large, mm -hmm. but small molecules, um, is being severely affected right now. The investor concern about the way they're picking which drugs they're going to go with is already starting to impact investment in large molecule. Um, and the challenge is that the drugs or the therapies or the treatments that never get to the patient because they never get funded, we won't know what we missed until 10 to 15 years from now. So it is, it is a very, very serious situation. That's just one example. Okay, other examples that we're dealing with right now, which are hurdles that companies, great companies like these are going to face. Sorry, guys. Okay. Is um, starting this year, it used to be that you got to treat your R&D expenses as an expense. Now you will be amortizing it over five years. I know of two companies, one in Arizona that is not going to make it until the next year because they're not going to be able to pay their bills after they can't amortize, they have to amortize their R&D. Okay. Because it changes their tax base. So, so those are examples of hurdles that well-meaning policymakers, they don't want to hurt patients. They don't want to hurt business, small businesses. They don't want to hurt entrepreneurship. They all love those things. How do we work together to educate them so that they don't have these unintended side effects in the future? Elsa? Wow, okay. <laughs> so, um, well, Joan, I, I, I know that when you were going to, you know, the, the the legislature here we you know you had invited us to talk about some of the good that we're doing and how you know certain companies are, are struggling and and needing this funding so obviously through you know organizations like easy bio that that do that and and you have a lot of these um you know uh, state reps and 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 you know the governor mm -hmm. and, and whatnot uh, you work with them to do this i think that the problem is much larger than that, right? So I went recently to um, health business uh, women's, uh, healthcare business women's association meeting at the Darwin Group that does research. And we were looking at, you know, integrated delivery networks and, you know, what's happening with hospitals. Uh, there were some uh, ladies there from the Banner Insurance Group. And so many hospitals, the only reason that they're keeping going is through their insurance arm, through their payer arms. And so many aspects of the the hospital system, uh, for example, you know, ERs and those they're 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 money losers, right? You know, some some, you know, uh, surgeries written and interventional procedures are still doing great. So it it we have to look at other ways to make the system uh, more cost effective. One of the things that we're looking at is, you know, being able to provide, you know, at home healthcare um, delivery and and you know through through these devices and monitoring systems that you could do at home. So maybe now, you know, instead of having to come back to the hospital. Um, you're still able to do a telehealth charge for that or go to a local, you know, uh, minute clinic or mm -hmm. Walgreens and whatnot and do that. So it's looking at ways for us from the medical device side to work with, you know, the, the, the payers and, and these, you know, the delivery uh, networks uh, to find ways to reduce costs and make, you know, without reducing uh, health care access. Okay. Stan? Yeah, so I've already uh, personally written to both state and all of our federal representatives a very polite message, and I got the typical perfunctory type of response back. But I think it's, in, and I'm thank, thank goodness we're a large molecule because there's a little bit more of an IP extension. Four years. You know, which helps a lot. But I think part of it is on, is on our backs, and what I tell investors is, Number one, you have to have great affinity and good manufacturing process, right? So 
We're at six grams per liter from a monoclonal antibody, actually better than that. So our COGS are gonna be exceedingly low. So you have to definitely crack that code. And I'm not into cell therapy, which I know is very expensive, but at least from a, an IgG4 general manufacturing perspective of a monoclonal, we're gonna be very inexpensive. So then we can pass that on uh, and, and for the ARDS indication, it's directly to the hospital. So we would be dealing with GPOs and J codes and the like, but you have to also do a very strong pharmacoeconomic study as part of your package. So this, I think it's, it's really sort of, a lot of it is incumbent upon us, right? I mean, do I wanna be a 20 plus billion dollar Humira someday with multiple indications? Sure, and I think the investors would like that as well. And I think we have the potential. However, you also at the same time have to recognize, like I'm not gonna be able to price this, and I haven't done any real elasticity work yet, we're still a bit early, but I know where we're gonna most likely need to price this in order to have very strong hospital penetration, but also for the other indications as a subcutaneous formulation. So I, I just believe that um, you know the politicians live in their somewhat bubble, and I think they have the best of intentions, but we just have to now respond and it's incumbent upon us to, to you know, change the dynamics and, and what we can control. We can only control so many things, but we have to get our cost of goods lowered. And you can still do that and still have very good gross margins and make everybody happy. But I think that that's, I think it really falls on us, I think. Jordan, one more quick one on that, and then we're going to go to closing thoughts. Sure, yeah. I mean, I think you you present a very good uh, question, not only to us, but to, to everybody on that, right? How are we going to be navigating those those changes as they come forth? And they're unfortunately complex, and there's no really good answer. Um, you know, we, are, we, Avery itself, is operating in the cell therapy space, and it, what's interesting is that we have a very uh, extensive network of cell and gene therapies through Alliance of Regenerative Medicine, which for us is a, a lobby group. Um, and interestingly, their largest national meeting is moving to Phoenix starting in uh, October of next year, which all, you know, sea level individuals from all over the world in cell and gene therapy will now be uh, at Camelback uh, in October. But anyways, they function as you know, a lobby and advocacy group to really push that, that connectivity with insurers and legislation and all of that type of stuff. And that's a unique thing for our specific domain. Um, I had a meeting, you know, I set up a meeting actually in DC this year because we could, we could bring the FDA in and be part of those conversations of these novel therapeutics. And, and on our front, you know, we're developing disease modifying therapeutics, right? Like there is nothing to, to cure these diseases. And so that's fundamentally different. Um, and hopefully we can tell, you know, package that story together with the, the, the environment that we have around us to really say, hey, we have the opportunity of changing human life in a very positive, meaningful way. These are the things that we need in order to be able to get the financing and capital available. Can, can I add, because yeah. I, most people here don't know, so the, the company that spun us off is actually now a gene therapy company. And so I do have a little bit of experience in the, in the gene therapy, you know, large molecule biotech side. Um, and. Uh, it is, I, I'm not sure if the orphan designation is also going to impact the rare dis pediatric disease designation because that's what they're developing. And, you know, they're using, you know, AV9s, and it is very, very expensive to manufacture these one shot, you know, uh, gene therapies. It, it, and yeah. we, we don't know how we're going to do yeah. it if some of that is. So, so just to clarify, so. The, right now, the federal government will be negotiating prices for Medicare, which means that for most pediatric, it doesn't apply. What peop, some people don't know is Medicare does extend beyond the elderly to severely ill patients. So it could have some PDAP Medicaid. implications. A lot of Medicaid uh, is, is, is P Medicare. Yeah. yeah, but this is just Medicare. But med there are Medicare, there are children in Medicare. So, um, yes, it, it would impact that, although they're not going to be in the top tiers, at least in the beginning. The, the other thing with cell and gene therapy that we have to do is the curative cell and gene therapies that are going to be very expensive. They are extremely expensive to manufacture. Um, there are new financial models that are having to be developed for that right now um, with the insurance industry, with Congress, and with others 
on what's fair on how to do that. Because if we have the ability to cure a life-threatening or life-changing disease, we want to be able to do that. But at the same time, we have to do it in a way that we don't bankrupt or break our current system and is fair to all of the stakeholders in that system. So there's a lot of work to be done on the, on the um, bioethics level, on the economic level, on the science level, on the entrepreneurial level. And I am so glad to have the three of you leading the charge as we move forward with the AZ advances. And one quick closing thought before we go to our keynote speaker, Jordan. I'm happy to be in Arizona. We've made a commitment to be in Arizona. We're going to do a lot of amazing things in Arizona. We're going to cure heart disease starting in Arizona. Thank you. Elsa. Likewise, and shameless plug, guys, go to Ponte Cura tomorrow. Go to the patient, Voice of the Patient tomorrow. This is important. If we want to commit, and we're wearing these little, these little pins, we have to be charitable. We, we have to be like other ecosystems. You know, it's, it's not just about the VCs and the angels and whatnot. It's, it's about all of us. And tomorrow's event is to help education and help you know those who students who are going into life sciences who are going to create companies mm -hmm. like these absolutely so just another big thank you to az advances and uh, i would just say that as i learned today there's some phenomenal science coming out of this state and i think uh, we shouldn't rest on our laurels but um, i'm looking forward to the next 10 years to come thank you very much thank you guys give them a hand